Good evening, everybody. My name is Dr. Joseph Schelser, for those of you who are not familiar with me. I'm the president and founder of the Italian American Museum here on the corner of Grand and Mulberry Street in Little Italy. And we're very pleased to have you here this evening for this production, this performance, this lecture and slideshow about Sacco and Vanzetti, um, the famous anarchists, unfortunately, that were, were executed to the turn of just about the beginning of the last century, 1923. Um, we have with us this evening uh, the acclaimed writer, actor, director, and producer, Daniel P. Quinn. Now, don't let the Quinn fool you. <laughs> just like many, many, many people, the families that are intermarried. My family intermarriage is between the same thing on the race. <laughs> Joining them also this evening will be musically accompanied by um, Sam Mayola. Sam is a drummer, musician, and he's going to be playing the bass ukulele, the bass ukulele, which I was not aware of. Um, so we're in, for, we're in for quite a treat. Without further ado, I'm very pleased to introduce you again to Daniel P. Quinn. Dan, please come up. An accomplishment, I think, for an Italian-American to study Italian and to sing it is really important. It's our biggest weakness in America to not communicate with Italy in their own tongue. And I am, I am so embarrassed that this has happened. I mean, it's a struggle term the language, but it's so important. To have Snooky in Italy as an American ambassador is just shocking. Oh, it's, it's, it's rock bottom. You know, I spent my entire life trying to establish that Americans weren't stupid. They were interested in Eastern Italian culture and the opera in literature, in Pasolini, in Fellini, in Luca D'Anconi, in La Scala, in Fruit of Strailer, that the work is the highest standards of our time, which should be appreciated. But we don't see it in America. We had a press on Broadway of Luca D'Anconi directing Goldoni's La Serva Amorosa in 1986. It ran three nights. It was a stupendous production. But the Times didn't cover it. But the Times Reader Festival in October in New York. It used to be a big event, and I used to help as a volunteer of that festival as an interpreter for the in New York City. Uh, they're a very interesting couple. Uh, Sacco and Lizetti were from Piemonte and from Apulia. They had a north-south connection, which is quite astonishing, but they were friends, because Italy is so fragmented in terms of, I'm from Naples, you're from Rome, I'm from Milan, who cares? <laughs> I mean, it's a terrible situation, and it still occurs today. Uh, there still is some hostility between the Lombard League and the South. Mm -hmm. So it is amazing to me that in 1919, these two people, a shoemaker and a fish peddler, met and became friends and got involved in workers' rights. Um, they were Massachusetts. And Massachusetts, I think, was different than New York City for the Italian <coughs> and that the Irish, my father's side of family, were the dominant class at that time in Boston and the area of Boston. And that the Italians were less understood there than they might have been in New York City. Um, so so there, was a, there, was a, there, was, there was a robbery attempt at Christmas Eve 1919 that didn't take place between Sopo and Nesetti, and they, they, they didn't go through with it. Yeah, sure. So they, they, got, they lost their nerve or whatever, and it didn't happen. Now, in the spring of the next year, 1920, they worked for a company called Slater Maroon, and that was a shoe factory manufacturer in Boston. And at that time, when you got paid a salary, you were paid in cash. No one got paid by check, it was all paid in cash. So, uh, so, so the, 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 the tender supplement is at the 1911, Shirtwaist fire happened in New York City. The strikes happening in Patterson, Lowell, Massachusetts, in 13, etc. The workers are not winning the strikes. They were still losing all these strikes. They were not getting higher wages. They were still being squashed. They were still dying on work sites in the mills in Patterson, in Lowell, in New York City. So it was not a happy situation. By 1920, uh, there was frustration and there was fear in America. Frustration was the work themselves who didn't get a fair deal. And uh, so, so, so I think in this situation, Sockland and Zetti got involved with, with some political leftists. <coughs> and 
decided to try taking their own, take into their own hands something besides protest, and that was perhaps doing a wrong. Now, one of the great problems here is that the K supplement entity is so confused and so convoluted and so biased and so messed up that no one to this day really knows what happened. Uh, there was a bias on the judge, there was a bias on the law, there was a bias by the ballistic expert on the case. So there were ongoing problems with the case, and the first lawyer uh, was not successful. They were tried twice, and they were convicted on consciousness of guilt. So the evidence of law circumstantial. Uh, Sacco uh, died first, execution, execution chair, uh, <coughs> might have been innocent, and Manzetti might have been guilty. That's one scenario. Uh, there, there was talk that, uh, let me go back. Uh, Bartel Manzetti was born in Piedmont, in Villa Valerica, 1888. And he died at age 39. <coughs> So he said he was an eel salesman with the Breeny family who he lived with in Massachusetts. <coughs> and the Breeny boy was his only alibi. And he told the judge he was the entire day with him selling eels. That was his alibi. Uh, uh, Nicola Sacco was born in uh, Puerto Majorre in Apulia, 1891, he was 36. And he was a shoe a shoemaker. And he was married and had a child named Dante. His, uh, his alibis were not, just not that secure. When they were first arrested, they were so panicky in the police station, they lied about their whereabouts. They didn't say the truth. So they became suspicious. So, and it was a language barrier also. So uh, that was the, the initial moments of the case began to you know, unravel because they were, they were scared to say anything and they, they were, they, and they didn't tell the truth. So that happened first. Uh, in, the, in the course of the, the robbery, uh, the, there was a driver named Boda who had a, had a car. And he was the driver of the car at that time during the robbery, the robbery took place. But he was never arrested. <clears throat> Only Sokol and Zeddy were arrested. And they were arrested a couple days later on a, on a train, a, tro a trolley in South Braintree. Uh, suspicion of being the little rock, did the rock. Now, no one knew, if the, no, there were no other witnesses, so no one said it was them, but because they were Italian and they wore hats and they had a language barrier and they were scared, they were suspicious. Um, Judge Thayer was, was a, uh, you know, Boston, hard rock Boston, and the, the, one of the problems was that as the trial started to take place, people were not convinced they were guilty or innocent. And almost today, in a way, like the O.J. Simpson trial, the media took over the trial, and the protests and the, and the um, propaganda from both sides started to take place, and the truth started getting lost in the media war. And it was, they were in prison for seven years before they were executed. So in a seven year period of time, both sides spent hundreds of hours saying they're innocent and guilty, blah, 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 blah. And in, and, and the, the, the brochure, so I say for not for sure. And what also happened here is very interesting about some of that is their greatest achievement was their letters from prison. They spent seven years, people who wrote to them, you know, with, with encouragement and you know, you're, you're okay, you're innocent, blah, 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 for seven years. And they wrote back and broke in English. And the letters they wrote back are so heartbreaking and so heartrending, they're amazing. But they're a collection all by themselves of an achievement by you know, immigrants coming to America and surviving the broken language to communicate to the world. And that's their legacy, you know, to us in many ways, is that broken thing. Now I do, now, now I'm unsure of myself, 30 years of their guilt or innocence. It's taken 30 years to become confused about it. But it wasn't certain, so I've, I've changed my position quite uh, since then. But uh, they did get framed. It was not a fair trial. They died, and uh, they probably shouldn't have. But then again, during the robbery, very Gelly, the guard was shot dead. He was Italian-American. And Parmenter was shot dead. 
Good evening, everyone. <coughs> Welcome to the Italian American Museum. My name is Ray Mealy. They call me Sam, my nickname. And uh, Daniel invited me here tonight to uh, just play some tunes from the, uh, the era of uh, Sacco and Benzetti. So I'm going to do a few tunes from the 20s, and uh, you'll probably recognize them. Uh, the first tune I'd like to do is I'm Forever Blowing Bubbles. You probably all know that. <coughs> It was first published in 1918. Music was written by John Coletti, lyrics by Brookman and Vincent. It debuted in a Broadway musical called The Passing Show of 1918. It's a melancholy tune about achieving your life's dreams while, while, while you're sleeping and waking up to reality. As the lyrics imply, pretty bubbles, they fly so high, like my dreams, they fade and die. Okay. I'm dreaming dreams, I'm scheming schemes, I'm building castles high, they're born anew, they're days a few, just like a sweet for the Bottom House at American Labor Museum. No isms need apply. Boom, build, building, built, bust. Clearance, clearing, clear, rust. Build, you must. But no one saw the bust. 1926, marks the railroad overpass in contemporary Patterson, where New Yorkers once moved west or north, anywhere, to suburbia, out of New York, hailed in first, perhaps, then fair one, I'm sure. 
Mr. Morgan or John D. paved the way. And then the Depression. Let's act now, the New Deal. Build up Olympic villages like Lake Placid and turn into jails like a capital watch to transform society, istiak, and turn our minds away from despair and depression. Years before 1913, that failed strike in Patterson, workers blocked out Patterson in 1849, the locomotive works, building for the Civil War, the Roeblings, the industrialists. Patterson, no father's son was this, locked out from Patterson. Blood in the streets, no justice, no peace. Meeting in Halden at the Casa Bato Bato House, thoughts of Casa Bata G. Antonio Basso would have been 28 then, and maybe there. First a few workers, then more, with other workers in their Sunday bests, and then hundreds, thousands more. Welcome to Halden, said their mayor, their socialist mayor, striking for a living wage rather than all the greed today. Depression lingered seven years or more. But memories linger, still visible. Railroad bridge to 1926. Optimism no before the crash. Striking for a living wage rather than all the greed today. Depression lingered seven years or more. But memories linger, still visible. Railroad bridge to 1926. Optimism before the crash, 2000. Daniel is a mentor of mine. I appreciate his work immensely. I, I learn so much from Daniel every day, every conversation. He's fascinating. And he tells really appreciate the culture so much. So it's exciting to have you read work past Sam? Uh, this, is, this is another tune from the 20s. You probably recognize this. It's called Babyface. Written by Betty Davis and Harry Axe. Actually, has never heard me do it, and it's it's not that it's 
that special one way or another, except for that it is such a, a lovely thing to actually sing this music that represents my family so much in so many ways, including, of course, my, my, my parent, who is still alive and well, um, but then again, my grandparents who have been long gone. Um, and so it is, it's uh, a theme from La Strada. And I will do it a cappella because it's hard to bring the music along. And it's, it's a little, it's better than doing uh, it with something recorded. So it goes. Tu chiamo non sai, tu chiamo non puoi. Sei stregata dell'amor. Son che stocchi tuoi, frei di più che mai. Ma che febbre nel tu cura. Hai sulle labbra che baci che non dai e che non vuoi. Ma desiderio tu chiamai, si spegnerà. Tu chiama non sai, tu chiama non puoi. Sei stragata dell'amor, con l'amor più bello. Mi son perso in te, ma per me tu non sai che è un mistero. Tu chiama non sai, tu chiama non puoi. Sei stregata dell'amore. Thank you very much.